Hello class, it's week three and I'm posting this video to give you a little better sense of who I am uh, with the information to help uh, frame the readings for you in the coming week. There'll be notes attached, attached as well if you'd like to read them. You read last week about the period from Wittenberg to Worms of Luther's critical years 1517 to 1521 and how at each step along the way where Luther was challenged in his attack on the sale of indulgences, rather than backing down as he was supposed to, he actually became more bold. And that's sort of what heightened the tension and made Worm such an important moment as Luther made his uh, well-known and famous stand, purportedly saying, here I stand, I can do no other. Some historians dispute whether he actually said that. One could say whether he said it or not, it's what he meant. The effect of Luther's challenge to Rome on indulgences was a kind of breaking of the floodgates. Once Luther challenged Charles V successfully, in addition to the Roman church establishment, and this was due in part from protection from his prince, Frederick the Wise, the elector of Saxony, other reformers began to criticize the church hierarchy and began movements of reform on their own. Some took the reforms much further than Luther, advocating not only theological, liturgical, and ecclesiastical reforms, but in some cases, radical political reforms as well. Sometimes called radical reformers or the left wing of the Reformation, the radical Reformation generally used scripture, and particularly the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel, as a vision for how humans should live together in community. Other key figures were Huldrych Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, and John Calvin. And a little bit about Luther's later years first. In his later years, Luther moved from being a critic to an actual reformer and shaper of a movement. After returning to Wittenberg in 1522, he gave eight sermons, sometimes called Invocavit sermons, that defined the problem that the people of Wittenberg faced. Having broken with Rome and with hostile force, forces and governments uh, surrounding them, and in some cases in their midst, what would they do to preserve the gospel and cause it to be heard and lived as a community? That was the key question, as Luther saw it at least. Now these reforms included, in part, education. Luther wrote the large catechism and the small catechism, to teach Christian basics. Large were for pastors, small was for the laity. It also included his reforms, community life, and engagement in society. Luther expected Christian parents, fathers in his patriarchal society, to teach their children the faith. And there were significant reforms in liturgy and music to include all people in worship. It really was uh, more and more a lay-driven movement. And significantly, in cities of the Reformation, there was a common chest, money that was kept for those in need. and would be given out, there were two keys, and uh, trustees of that chest could take money out and give it to those um, as they had need. So that's a significant piece also. In 1525, Luther married Katharina von Bora, affecting significantly his view of marriage and, and what it meant. Intimacy and relationships as part of the Christian life. And more and more he became open as many priests denied their vows of celibacy to abstain from sex. Uh, that was a huge change in the Reformation that you had priests who then suddenly were married and had families. And by the 1530s, Luther was engaged with the Schmalkaldic League, a defensive religious alliance of Lutheran princes formed to defend their territories from foreign threats, mostly Catholic princes and lands. The Schmalkald articles that Luther wrote were intended to define the religious commitments of these princes and their territories, and is a key text in the Lutheran Conf Confessions, which is the, the Book of Concord, uh, the collection of writings um, that the Lutheran Church uh, confesses as true. Luther wrote uh, also horrible treatises, especially the one against the Jews. It was called On the Jews and Their Lies. Even after he had written a friendly treatise as a younger man, encouraging Christians to, to befriend Jews uh, 
and to realize that they were actually Christ's relatives. That was called that Jesus was born a Jew. The ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, has rejected and con rightly condemned this document as contrary to its self-understanding as a church. Whatever it means to be Lutheran, it does not mean that. In summary, Luther became crankier as he got older, but he never lost his commitment to the gospel and its transformative power, nor did he lose sight of lay renewal in the church and commitment to community as the key to health. In addition to threats from Catholic opponents, Luther and others faced the rise of radical reformers, as mentioned earlier. Luther referred to these pejoratively as Vita Teufa, Anabaptists in English, because they rejected infant baptism, thought it was relatively meaningless, and would re-baptize adults once they came to true faith in Christ um, as an act of, of their own uh, will, and mature will. Luther is what was called a magisterial reformer because he took the side of the princes and criticized the radical reformers for taking his teachings too far. The first, and one he probably knew best, Luther, was a fellow faculty member at the University of Wittenberg named Andreas Karlstadt. Karlstadt was a conservative theologian until Luther kind of unpopped the cork of the medieval system. After that, Karlstadt became radicalized, taking on peasant garb and style and denying any sense of hierarchy or authority for himself or anyone else. Other radical reformers were Thomas Münzer, who led a violent uprising in Saxony, the territory where Wittenberg is, and, and, and Menno Simons, who was a pacifist after whom the Mennonites are named. The Amish, who came to rural Pennsylvania, had a historic connection to the Mennonites. So you see, Münzer and Simons represent extremes in the radical Reformation. Both agreed that the princes were evil and needed to be resisted for the sake of their religious beliefs. But there were those who would take up arms to resist, Münzer, and there were others as well, and those who would not, Simons. The second most prominent reformer, arguably, and contemporary of Luther, was Huldrych Zwingli, a Swiss reformer who was most active in the city of Zurich. His reform movement was parallel to Luther's, and they shared many views in common. They met at the Marburg Colloquy in 1529 in an attempt to join forces and strengthen their common cause. However, they disagreed fundamentally on Holy Communion. Luther believed that Christ is truly present, and when pressed, he said, in, with, and under the bread and wine of the Eucharist, while Zwingli believed that Christ was present spiritually, perhaps, but that the risen Lord Jesus could never be present in corruptible earthly elements. And uh, Zwingli was notably killed in battle at the age of 47 as a part of the struggle between Catholic and Protestant cantons or states um, in Switzerland. Philip Melanchthon was an important figure in the Reformation as well, working closely alongside Luther in Wittenberg. Melanchthon wrote Loci Communes, an attempt to put this Reformed theology into a system of doctrines. He also wrote the Augsburg Confession, which is really the document that defines the Lutheran Church and its most basic theological positions. The first 11 articles, which were secondary reading for today, show what Lutherans believe. Much is the same as what Catholics taught, and not terribly controversial. Even Luther said at Worms, my opponents, many of them, agree that some of the things I've written are helpful. The key difference, however, is Article 4 on justification. Luther said that this was the article on which the church stands or falls. Really, really important for Protestants and especially for Luther and the Lutherans. Melanchthon said that Christians are justified for Christ's sake through faith and by grace. Is that right? Justification, they're justified by grace for Christ's sake through faith. Melanchthon had an ecumenical spirit in that he was always trying to find common ground with other Christians, even with Catholics. In fact, in Marburg, Melanchthon ironically steered Luther away from Zwingli in the hopes that Lutherans might still find common ground with the Catholics. The great 20th century Luther scholar, Roland Bainton, 
in his landmark book, Here I Stand, argued that this prevented the Reformation movement from becoming even stronger than it was. After Luther died, there was a school of Lutherans actually called the Philippists, who always were kind of wanting to find unity with other Christians in the spirit of Melanchthon. And they opposed the, what were called the Gnesio, or authentic Lutherans, who believed that Luther's teaching, based on scripture, had to be defended at all costs. The German slogan, Gottes Wort und Luther's Lehr vergehen nie und nimmer mehr. God's word and Luther's teaching will never die and never go away. The Gnesio Lutherans saw Philip's attempt at unity, especially on the Eucharist, as a betrayal of their tradition. These two traditions continue within Lutheranism and in Protestantism more broadly. The drive for doctrinal purity on the one hand, before one can say one is truly unified with other Christians, and the call for unity in Christ on the other, which Jesus called for, um, sometimes perhaps at the expense of uh, doctrinal purity. Now you can decide where you fall on that spectrum. In the United States, for example, and very broadly speaking, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, or LCMS, and the ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, represent these two strands in their views of ecumenism. The Missouri Synod tends to strive for doctrinal purity, and the ELCA um, wants to find common ground with other Christians, and it tends to be more open on social um, and political issues, whereas the Missouri Synod tends to be more conservative, although not always. Without question, the other great reformer of the 16th century, about a generation behind Luther, was John Calvin, whose dates are 1509 to 1564. Cal Calvin also studied law, like Luther, and in his theological system, he called the Institutes of the Christian Religion, many believe that he took Luther's reforms and teachings to their logical conclusions, that he was Luther's best student. Calvin is, uh, in this style, much more organized than Luther in his thinking, with a beginning, a middle, and an ending. When you read Luther, you get the sense that you're just reading kind of a mass of thought, a stream of consciousness that hover around this, this basic conviction about justification, or God's word, or God's grace, or the gospel. He uses a lot of words to describe this, but there's really kind of a glowing core for Luther. You can already see in the first five chapters of Calvin's Institutes, which are also assigned for today, a strong emphasis on the majesty of God. That's a big deal to Calvin. God's majesty, glory, and providence are all terms used by those who followed Calvin's teaching, also called Calvinists. Calvinism has had an enormous influence on Protestant denominations, most notably the Presbyterian Church and the Reformed Church. However, indirectly, his influence has stretched to the English Reformation and American Evangelicalism, although there have been theological debates within each of these traditions over the true Calvin, much like the Philippists and the Gnesio Lutherans. The Swiss Reformed theologian Karl Barth, a 20th century theologian, uh, 1886 to 1968, played a role in redefining Calvinism in the modern era, emphasizing God's grace in a hopeful universalism. This was in opposition to Calvin's doctrine of double predestination. It was a core conviction of the Reformation that the Holy Spirit was the primary actor in Christian faith. One does not bring oneself to faith in Christ, rather, it is a gift of God's grace. The Church Father St. Augustine taught that, since one could not choose to love God properly, then God must have predetermined certain people for salvation. It sounds strange to modern ears. Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, believed this as well. Calvin took it a step further and said that God must have then chosen certain people also for damnation, which sounds even more horrifying to modern ears, but it was perfectly logical to Calvin. However, in the assigned reading for today, Calvin points to something other than just God's majesty, the human subject. Note that knowledge of self and knowledge of God are deeply intertwined. To know God is to know self, and to know self is to know God. The two go together. You can't have one without the other. So if you know God as some kind of abstraction that has nothing to do with you, then it, it's not really God you're talking about. And likewise, if you're uh, focused on yourself too much in the wrong way, then you're not really going to know or understand God either. 
He further makes the point, as all the Reformers do, that proper knowledge of God comes through faith, which is rooted in the subjective experience of regeneration, which Luther calls Heilsgewissheit, or assurance of salvation. Knowledge of God does not come through theological or philosophical speculation. This is really, really important to understand in the difference between Protestants and, and Catholics and, and other uh, uh, wisdom traditions. Calvin and his followers are deathly allergic to this. Now, it's sometimes criticized as being um, unfair and or, or overly negative about human beings in his anthropology, his understanding of human beings, but he has a really a heightened view of human sin and a very low view of human goodness, and thus we're even more utterly dependent on God's grace um, in our theology. Bart, for example, was utterly opposed to any kind of natural theology. That is, a theology that begins from observation of the natural world and then leads to a general knowledge of God. The Word of God, which is most fully understood as uh, Jesus Christ incarnate, crucified and risen, that is the core of the Christian faith. And it is in hearing this word that one comes to true knowledge of God and self. And that is the foundation for Calvin's entire system and is essential for understanding Calvinism. Now Calvin and Zwingli to some degree and other uh, reformers that took that direction, uh, and I noticed in some of your posts you talked about art and image. They tend to be more negative about uh, images, uh, any, uh, following the commandment against graven images for God. So you, you notice too in Calvinist and Reformed churches generally they're more sparse. There's not as much artwork, it's not as colorful, as decorative. Luther, while he didn't see art as being essential to faith, it was the hearing, faith comes from hearing, um, he found it helpful and it was good to have. And he was actually horrified that some people who claimed to follow his teaching went around churches in Germany and started to destroy art. He thought the art was, was good and if it helped people, that they should keep it. It's what he would call adiaphora or an unnecessary thing that if it's helpful, uh, you keep. If it's not, you scuttle. Um, Calvinist was Calvin was and the Calvinists were a little more purists, uh, and I heard a great uh, a pastor define the difference between Luther and Calvin. This was a Presbyterian minister. Is um, Luther, if you imagine the Reformation or the Church being like a sock drawer, um, Luther opened the sock drawer and took out the things he didn't like or didn't want, um, and and that was his Reformation. Calvin took the sock drawer out, dumped it out, and only put back in the things that he wanted. So it was a little bit more thorough purging or cleansing of those things he didn't consider Protestant enough. Now that being said, Calvin actually and Luther did have a positive view of nature, of the non-human natural world. Calvin even says that in the Institute that nature is God, although he says it hesitantly and he almost says it's dangerous to say to unregenerate Christians because they might misunderstand it and try to identify the natural world with God in the wrong way. Rather, once one has heard and internalized the word and knows themselves to be saved, then they can see all of creation as what he called the theater of God's glory. This grand image defined creation in Calvin's view. The creation exists and is good, but its purpose is to express God's glory, not just to be pondered or valued for its own sake. Luther and his followers took a slightly different view, which can be seen in his doctrine of Holy Communion. Christ is present, as I mentioned, in, with, and under the bread and wine. Uh, as, uh, and behind this is a view of divine human mixing, uh, which Calvinists really do not share. For them, the two natures of Christ, divine and human, and that's an important uh, piece in Christian doctrine as well, can be seen as something like oil and water, or uh, um, like uh, two boards nailed together. <laughs> they coexist in the same space, a human and divine nature, but not truly integrated, because eternity and that which is temporal could never really be reconciled. Melanchthon, in lecturing on physiology of all things in Wittenberg later uh, in his career, notes that God and human nature mingle therein, even in the human body. 
And as for nature per se, Luther did not really believe it was divine. Rather, all things visible are created. They're dependent on God. They're a product of God's love and grace. Luther would agree that the non-human natural world is a kind of theater of God's glory in a way that uh, Calvin would later formulate it. But it might be more accurate to say that Luther saw the creation as the place where God's grace is realized. The sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, for example, are means of grace, Lutherans say, present in physical elements, empowered by the word, received in faith. Luther's theology of creation teaches that the universe per se is not divine, but that God's presence is so shot through the natural world that any part of the universe can be, in the words of 20th century theologian Joseph Sittler, an occasion of grace. So that's my talk for this week to give you a, a background on the material and uh, the reading. So I, I wish you the best in, in your reading. Feel free to write me if you have any questions. Um, and I look forward to um, the online posts and dialogue. I would like to suggest um, as a, a benchmark for what we're doing that when you, that you uh, take in the presentation material that I'm, that I'm presenting and that you each respond to at least two uh, uh, fellow students with something substantive. And I'll write a little bit more about this, too, in my, in my post on, on the Moodle website. But I, I wish you the best. Happy reading, and we'll talk again soon.